Hey everyone, before we dive into today's episode, I do want to give you a quick content warning. This episode does involve a conversation about child abuse and the traumas that come out of living in that type of situation. That conversation also includes a brief mention about suicidal ideation. If that is something that you can't handle today, it does come in at about 43 minutes in the episode. Otherwise, I hope you enjoy the episode and please do take care of yourself. Hello and welcome back to You Are What You Love. I am your host, Marissa Tandon, and my guest today is Ella Watts. She is a producer and director primarily in the audio drama world. You may have most recently heard her work with the BBC's Doctor Who Redacted. So please welcome Ella to the show. Hello, thank you very much for having me. I have been enjoying this podcast enormously, uh, partly because there's a lot of people that I'm a fan of in the podcast space already on this feed being interviewed, and (laughs) partly because a lot of the stuff that's been mentioned is already stuff I love, especially like the fact you had a cabin pressure episode and a Buffy episode. I was just like, oh, (laughs) this is my life. This is great. This is everything I've ever wanted. (laughs) I, yeah, I, I, um, as we've gone through, I've been like, I, had a plan with this podcast and it seems like part of that plan was talk to people I really like um for hours (laughs) and call it work so (laughs) um that's working out for me and I'm glad it's working out for you uh yeah so um in in spirit of doing so so glad to have another person I really like on this podcast to chat um what are we talking about today what is the piece of media that changed you forever okay so I am not normal about these books. Um, They are the Mortal Engines Quartet by Philip Reeve, which is a series of four books uh, set in a kind of post-apocalyptic steampunk universe. Um, Mm. It's very important to me that we establish at the top that we are not talking about the film because the film is trash and should be set on fire. Uh, The books (laughs) are some of the greatest books ever written. The film is trash. Just one more time. The books are great. The film is trash, um, but we're talking about the books. So, I have to tell you, I'm excited to talk about the books because the only After context I had for the engines mortal before engines started, before we started, like when you reached before, out, like about, you reached doing, out about, doing, about doing, I'm going to retake that. Um, um, the only context I had for the mortal engines when you chose this as your topic was the movie. Um, and the reason I have that context is because they cast Robert Sheehan in it. And unfortunately for myself, ever since the Misfits TV series, I will watch anything that man does. <laughs> Oh my god, no, me too. I have such a huge crush on Robert Sheehan. And I was, I cannot tell you the level of emotional agony I went through when I saw that he had been cast as one of my all-time favorite book characters and also that the movie ruined it. It was really like my love of Robert Sheehan versus my love of Mortal Engines and my love of Mortal Engines did win out, but I am so sad that I didn't get to see him being Tom Natsworthy, but I know if I do, it'll ruin my love for Robert Sheehan forever. So I'm like, yeah. I'm, I'm still, I'm preserving my love of him by never watching that because it wasn't his fault. It was Peter Jackson. I don't blame Robert. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Yeah. He's just had this, unfor- I mean, recently I feel like the curse has been broken, but he's gotten cast in like these major adaptations that should be huge blockbuster franchises. And then they only get one movie. Like he also did City of Bones. Um, and that was for me the huge one. I was like, He's going to be Simon. Simon. (laughs) Oh my God. Yes, 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 yes. Absolutely. In every single way. I was obsessed with those books as well. Like there was, there was definitely a period where I was, yeah, I was very obsessed. I was, I was not normal about it. Um. (laughs) No, no, but this is all about not normal. So (laughs) I love, love to hear it. Well, so you're, you're going to have to tell me uh, what your experience was with the books because for me, I actually am realizing despite it being completely up my alley I don't think I was ever marketed to them until like when the movie came out, I didn't know it was a book. Um, So I am curious what the first experience you had uh, discovering these books was. Oh, my gosh. Okay, so (laughs) they were in my school library. Uh, I was a voracious reader as a kid. I was and am also deeply neurodivergent. I'm autistic and I have ADHD. And what that broadly meant was that I was like savagely bullied and also like exclusively friends with like my teachers. So I just used to spend like all of my like kind of like lunch breaks in the library being friends with the librarians, helping them move books, because that was 14 year old me's idea of a good time. And um, (laughs) one of the things that happened was I just like read every book in my school library, like that was fiction. And I also read all of the nonfiction about like world history and folklore. I had a lot of time because I didn't have friends. Um, And 
I just picked up Mortal Engines because it was the next book on the shelf. And uh, I read it and it completely changed my life um, <laughs> and just blew my mind. And I was like, wow, you can like fiction can be this because up until that point, I'd been reading kind of like slightly kind of vapid, like 12 year old targeted young adult fiction or 13 year old or 14 year old, or at one point, a deeply inappropriate David Eddings book that I borrowed from the town library, which I definitely shouldn't have read at that age. <laughs> there was like BDSM. It was a whole thing. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, like so I'd, I'd read a lot of like random different books, um, but I'd never read anything that really synthesized the themes and tropes and motifs and also like social and moral values and storytelling styles that I in enjoyed and cared about so much and so effectively and so inventively until I read Mortal Engines and it completely blew my baby mind. Um, and one of the main things actually for me about the Mortal Engines Quartet is it's a deeply, deeply feminist series of novels. And I think that it was like 13, 14 year olds me, 13, 14 year old me's first encounter with really truly feminist fiction. Um, and at the time, I, I was brought up in a deeply abusive environment. Um, for a while, I was living at a Catholic boarding school that was deeply abusive and deeply misogynistic um, in their theology as well as just in their general practice. And I didn't know what feminism was. I didn't really understand like sexism or misogyny as like I understand it now as an adult. So I didn't even know why this book like resonated with me so powerfully and so deeply. I just knew that it was just like sacred to me. And and the way that the main female character Hester Shaw was written, she was sacred to me. And she was like so precious to me. And it was, it was, it was interesting because I was talking to you about this when we were kind of discussing like what to talk about like before. Um I never got into the fandom for Mortal Engines, which was quite unusual for me because I was a massive fandom kid. I first started writing and reading fan fiction when I was like 11 years old. I was one of those people who would print out my favorite fan fiction so I could read them in class. I like drew the anime like characters and everything. I did the how to draw anime stuff. I obsessively drew anime eyes. Like I was like a big fandom kid, but I never got into fandom for Mortal Engines. And it was because for me personally, my experience of fandom is often that I get into a fandom when I'm like, I need to fix it. So like mm. the BBC Melon is a really good example. I love BBC Melon. There is so much about BBC Melon I would change. And I obsessively engaged with the fandom because I was like, these are all the ways those conversations should have happened differently. Um, and I would read fanfic where it would be like, this is how it should have happened, you know, kind of thing. Um, whereas sometimes I encounter a piece of art that is so beautiful and so like holy to me that I, I don't feel the need to change it. And I'm just like, actually, mm. I just want it to exist as it exists. And I don't need it to be transformed. And I don't need yeah. there to be stories outside of what happened because the story that happened on the page was the story that needed to be told. And so with Mortal Engines, I never told like people my age, like, oh, I'm really into this book. It was just, it was like, it was my private, like, yeah, like holy thing. I keep using the words like holy and sacred. I am agnostic, uh, but because of the aforementioned Catholic environment, a lot of my language when I'm trying to express like very strong emotion like comes to religious language. <laughs> um, but like just what I'm trying to express is just very strong feeling, a very deep love. Um, yeah. And yeah, so like it, it was it was an interesting experience. Um, and then just every book I read was just yeah, just a revelation in that series. Um, and 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 it, it got me through going through like adolescence and, and going from being a teenager to being an adult. I think the last one came out when I was 18. Um, and so those, those four books kind of like went with me as I, as I grew up. Um, and every single one made me think differently about fiction and about society and also like always about like womanhood and personhood and femininity and how it's portrayed in fiction. Um, which, which again, is, is something that really frustrates me about the way that people talk about the books because no one ever focuses on that. Like when people sell the books, when the movie was coming out, it was like, oh, this is a fun steampunk thing. Yeah. But it wasn't like, this is a feminist narrative. This is a feminist narrative. It's also very much a narrative about a disabled protagonist. It is a disabled mm. feminist narrative. And that's crucial to the book um, and the book series. Uh, but that's not how people talk about it. It really frustrates me. It's really misold. I, so I think one of the things I love about that story is I got this like image of you working your way through each shelf of the library. And then you mentioned like 
you were reading mostly vapid kind of teen fiction before then. So I'm watching like in my brain, you've gotten through like the last Gossip Girl book and then the next book on the shelf was, was The Mortal Engine. <laughs> and then, um, but I do think like thinking back as you were talking, I realized I had a very similar kind of attachment to fiction in books um, where I was reading all the time uh, and just nonstop and working through kind of everything I could find. Um, but there was also at that age a, a, a real interest in some of that vapid fiction. Um, and I don't know if it was because it was like I use Gossip Girl as an example because I read I feel all of those books. Um, and then when and then the TV show was coming out and obviously it was just very, um, you know, watching watching it back now, you look at it and you're like, oh, God, um, I don't think we should have been <laughs> I don't think we should have been involved in this. Um, looking back on it, I wonder if the attachment to it was this idea that like this is what you're supposed to be doing in high school. And I'm certainly not doing that um, or middle school or whatever year you're sort of looking at it. And there's like uh, almost an aspirational is the wrong word because I don't think 11 year olds should be aspiring to do what Blair Wald Waldorf and Serena Vanderwoodson are doing in those books. But I do think there was some sort of quality where you were feeling like, okay, maybe this is where I'm supposed to be and I'm not there. So uh, it's almost like a handbook of sorts. Um, but then when you find that piece of fiction that makes you connect in a way that feels like what you're describing is that it actually is scratching something that is true about yourself rather than something that you're judging about yourself. And I think there's something really powerful in finding that book that makes you flip that switch where Gossip Girl can become more like a fun, trashy novel and less about something that feels missing. And the book that can kind of change you as a person is the one that says at the time you don't have the language to realize what it is. Like you said, it's a, a disabled feminist narrative and they're saying beautiful things about being a woman. But at the time, it just feels right. It just feels familiar. Um, I don't know if that feels similar to your experience. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean, I should be clear. I love trashy fiction. I love it. Um, and like for me growing up, it was the Roswell books, which are just mm. such trash. They're such trash, but I was obsessed with them. And I, and I definitely had a thing of like both being a teenage girl and also as a neurodivergent person where I was like, oh, this is how you're supposed to be a teenager. And, yeah. you know, all these descriptions of like outfits and conversations and gossip that I just it wasn't really understanding I was like well maybe books will tell me how to do the thing um so like absolutely like, I find that very relatable but yeah the thing about model engine and it's really interesting because I, I mean I should say like it's written by like a white guy like Philip Reeve I think is great but like you mm -hmm. know he's not a woman but the thing that was so revolutionary to me is so the protagonists of uh the first book and and the series are Hester Shaw and Tom Natsworthy. Mm -hmm. Tom Natsworthy is the himbo damsel in distress. He's such an idiot. And his superpower <laughs> is he's super nice and fluffy and ever so sweet. Um and also his massive flaw is he can be very vain and arrogant in part because he's a man. Um mm. and he at the start of the book so if you're listening and you don't know, uh, Model Engines is set in a post-apocalyptic future where the Earth has become so irradiated that humanity live on what are called traction cities, these massive cities built on huge caterpillar wheels, and they just like drive across the Earth. And one of my favorite, favorite, favorite things of all times about these books is that the first sentence of the first book is the same as the last sentence of the last book. And that Ooh. sentence is... It was a dark, blustery day in spring, and the city of London was chasing a small mining town across the dried up bed of the old North Sea. And it just, first of all, I just think that's a masterclass in an opening sentence because it so clearly establishes the world for you very quickly. And it's quite a high concept world. Um, but yeah, so you've got traction cities going around the earth. And that's because there was a nuclear apocalypse, essentially. And it set humanity back massively technologically. So people refer to CDs, which are strange silver pieces of jewelry that are circular and made of some kind of hard material and flat and were clearly supposed to be worn as necklaces. Uh, <laughs> or there's a con artist called Penny Royal who claims to be a historian archaeologist. And he says he's found the lost continent of America where they're still doing things like they used to do before the 62nd war and he met a woman in a bearskin bikini called washing machine which was the kinds of names they used back then um <laughs> and like you know it's this is this world that's completely forgotten our like 21st century technology but a lot of the technology kind of post where we are right now in 2022 but before where they are in the post-apocalypse 
um, you know, was world endingly destructive. And so there's kind of an arms race happening constantly between the cities to try and like reclaim satellites, old computers to understand what they are, to try and use them to get more power in this kind of like essentially endless civil war. And Tom is a historian who uh, is obsessed with archaeologists because in this world, archaeologists are very influential because they can find new technology. Um, and they are, but they're also explorers. So it's sort of like if you squish together kind of Victorian adventurer explorers and the way that the British Empire would celebrate those kinds of people with like kind of a Steve Jobs type person in the way that we day of like technological innovators, like they really are like celebrities who are also considered to be necessary to social advancement. So there's this guy called Valentine who is gorgeous and handsome and charismatic and a fantastic writer. And also he's discovered all of this amazing technology that's advanced London. And so he's really like the hero of London. People love him. And Tom Natsworthy, all he wants is to grow up one day and be Valentine. He wants to be the guy who people, who writes his own books where he goes into the wilderness and he comes back with a new way to save the city. And also he's gorgeous and everyone wants to be with him. Um, so, you know, Tom's got this like deeply unrealistic idea of like who he's going to be. One day Valentine's like, okay, come down with me. We're going to go down to kind of the refuse center where we pick up trash from the irradiated earth. And we also pick up scavengers who live there who can trade us like random things. And we look through it to see if there's anything valuable. Tom's like, great. This is my origin story. This is chapter one of my book. And it's chapter one of this book. Because he's like, now I'm going to be Valentine's protege. I'm going to be the next Valentine. I'm going to meet a gorgeous woman. It's all going to be so cool. I'm a teenage boy. That's all I think about. <laughs> and in the queue of these mysterious scavengers from the desert, he sees this woman with a scarf across her face and bright red hair. And he's like, oh my God this is my femme fatale. She's so oh gorgeous. I can't see her face. She's this beautiful mystery. She's so beautiful and I need to know everything about her. And then that gorgeous woman with the red hair tries to murder Valentine, steals a bunch of shit and <laughs> runs off. And Tom is still like, he's in his own adventure novel. He's like, great, I'm going to chase her. I'm going to catch her. And when I catch her, Valentine's going to be like, I knew you had potential, Tom. And she's going to be like, I regret my wicked ways, Tom, because you're just so handsome. And it's all great. And it's all kind of pacing along and it's fantastic. And then Tom nearly gets to the point where he's going to stop her. They're standing over this big opening between the city and the earth. And that's like a 200 foot drop. If you fall down that opening, you're going to die. Mm. And he grabs this girl and he pulls the scarf off her face and he sees that half of her nose has been completely cut off and she has an enormous, massively facially disfiguring scar. And she is ugly to him. And he's like, oh, well, that's not what would happen in the romance novel. And she's furious with him. And then Valentine catches up with them. And Tom's like, well, okay, I guess she's not my love interest. She's just the bad guy, whatever. Like, I still need to get the thing back. It's fine, I'll stop him. Mm -hmm. And Valentine turns up and Tom's like, great, well, I still, I can still get Valentine to help me. And Valentine just kind of looks at both of them, sees that there isn't anyone watching and pushes them both out the thing and uh, both out the vent and murders them, both of them. Oh. And Tom's like, oh, okay. As he's falling. Um, because it turns out that Valentine would rather have both of them dead than risk the fact that this redhead could say anything incriminating about him. Now, obviously, Tom survives the fall. And we go into this story with Hester and Tom, and I'm not going to recap the entire book this way, but that's like, <laughs> <laughs> like one of the chapters. But, but the reason I'm giving you all this context is one of the really, really, really cool things about Hester Shaw as a character is that throughout the books, they, there's, there's a lot of conversation about the expectation of like women to conform to certain beauty standards, the way mm. that women who are disabled, especially with any kind of facial disfigurement, are disqualified from those beauty standards, and the way that they are therefore de dehumanized because they cannot conform to a set of beauty standards that do not include them, and the way that they are shamed for that, and the way that they are devalued for that, and also like the way that like the men around them constantly try to negotiate a way in which you can force them to conform in some way. So when she's got the scarf across her face and she's got the pretty red hair, well, she she fits. She's allowed. Mm. But when she doesn't have the scarf, she's not. She's a monster. And Hester is so angry about this. And she is so disinterested. She She's this fascinating character because on the one hand, she's so disinterested in even trying to like fit these standards because she thinks they're really stupid. Yeah. But on the other hand, she has this constant source of like shame and frustration and grief that she was she was disfigured as a child by uh someone who, who cut her with a knife. Can I say spoilers on this? Yeah. I mean, okay. we can say there's a spoiler coming, but I yeah, I think so. <laughs> okay, there's a spoiler coming. <laughs> Hester was disfigured by Valentine. And mm. one of the really interesting ways that that plays out is that Valentine is a beautiful man and Hester mm. is an ugly woman. And because Hester 
hates Valentine, but no one ever takes her side because she's ugly and he's beautiful. And surely the mm -hmm. beautiful person is right. Mm -hmm. And so she's she has so much anger about this and so much grief about the fact that because she was disfigured as a child, she is disqualified from being a human being by so many people. Um, and a lot of shame and frustration about that. And throughout the books, she has all of these deeply complicated feelings about her existence as a woman, about the ways that she wants to be beautiful, but also she doesn't think she should have to be. But she wants to be loved and she feels like to be loved, she has to be beautiful. But also she doesn't think she should have to be beautiful to be loved because she has so much else that she can do. And she's endlessly wrestling with this. And for me as a teenage girl who, you know, is struggling with like my weight and my skin and like my posture and clothes and makeup, having this character who is bite absolutely any definition, the biggest badass in the series, who is this lethal killer, who knows more about anything, who Tom falls deeply and irrevocably in love with, and then loyally loves for the next four books, who also endlessly struggles with these questions of beauty and personhood as a woman in this world. That was like, just like life changing to me that, that she, she she's so furious and she's not good. Like she does bad things. In the second book, there's a spoiler coming. <laughs> she fully sells out an entire city of people because she's jealous that Tom is talking to a pretty girl. She Classic. murders a city of people. She just takes some money and betrays them because she's yeah. just like, well, fuck you. I don't know if I'm allowed to swear. Um, swear. Okay. <laughs> uh, she, she, she's, she's just like, well, fuck you. You don't get to treat me like this. So actually I'm just going to force you to need me. And she forces Tom to need her by destroying the city they're on. Like, and she, she's not always a good person, but she's always, but she's never vilified by the narrative. Her anger is always reasonable. It makes sense. You get why she's so bitter. You get why she's so furious and violent and brilliant and so much smarter than anyone else in the books. And she's just this deeply, deeply complex character that I just never got from female characters in books. Um, and anyway, this, this long ramble to end it is the reason that I knew I wouldn't like the film is in the film, the actress that they've got playing Hester has this nice little delicate chin scar. Yeah. It, do, fun fact, in the second book, someone does that to Hester. Well, actually in the second and third book. So in the second book, this con artist that I mentioned earlier with the washing machine girl, um, Penny Royal, he's in the mm. second book on the city that Hester and Tom are on. And he becomes interested in their story because he thinks he can make a bestseller out of it. Like essentially an airport book. Like that's all he writes. He writes trash. In the next book, that his book about what happened in the second book is so successful that one of the traction cities has built a little museum to like their story, which has been like mythologized. And the character of Hester has been mythologized. And Hester happens upon this museum without Tom by herself. And she's wearing a scar scarf across her face because she always has to, because otherwise people react to her with dis disgust. And she comes in she talks to the guy at the counter. There isn't anyone else inside. And there's this huge mural which has a painting of her where her scar is a delicate little scar on her cheek mm. so that she still looks traditionally beautiful. And as she's leaving the museum, and this was like one of the things that really stuck with me, the guy at the counter looking at her with her scarf across her face goes, you know what? You look just like Hester Shaw. And it's this like gut-wrenching moment for Hester where like, she finally gets to be the beautiful woman that everyone wants her to be, but it's not her because they don't want her to be her. And mm. the whole point, the whole point, like, a, well, not the whole point, but like a significant point of her character is the idea that you could have a woman with a facial disfigurement who's the hero, not the villain. And you could have a woman with a facial disfigurement that like is really, truly disabling. And also she's heroic and beautiful and lovable and a love interest. And the yeah. fact that the movies did to that character, what a villainous character does in the books <laughs> to that character, was just, I was like, okay, cool. You literally didn't understand the point of this book. You literally yeah. didn't understand the point of this book. No, I think, I, I, I think that is so powerful, especially to be reading that at the age where everything about your brain starts to wonder how you are worthwhile to other people I suppose and how you fit into society and I think what I really loved listening to you describe is this idea that I think a lot of times feminist movements make you feel like you're supposed to be happy with yourself regardless of how society sees you and that's what being a feminist is and being able to say like I'm happy with my weight I'm happy in my body I wouldn't change anything about myself and I think that sentence every time someone says it like rings so 
false to me. It doesn't mean that it's not true when they say it. It may be true to them. But for me listening to it, when someone asks, like, what is what would you change about yourself? And someone says nothing. I always, always, always want to be like, I just don't think that's I don't think it's true. Like, I think we are constantly in that complicated war of I want to love myself, but loving myself means that I have to be happy with how I fit into society. And fitting into society is hard, even if you do feel like you fit that beauty standard. And I think that's super interesting, too, it, where where you're able to get this narrative from Hester, who specifically has something very clearly that would disqualify her from that. But there's also this element of being able to cover it up. Um, and to be at that point acceptable as long as you can't see this thing that's wrong about her. And I think there's that beautiful metaphor of that's what we do. That's that's the same thing we're asked to do as women. Like you don't like the way your eyebrows look. So here is some some stuff to make them look better. Like there's the new trend of now you need to, I guess, have your eyebrows going upwards instead of to the side that you should look delicately mis delicately untamed, you know, and there's just so many little things like I think at that age you start to learn how to wear makeup like you start to realize like oh concealer's a thing um I do have pimples on my face which is normal because I'm going through puberty and my hormones are all over the place but uh I should make sure no one knows that I have a pimple on my face I think there's something really interesting about that character being able to cover what is wrong and with that covering being able to fit into the beauty standard and as soon as you take it off I loved this moment that you described of well she can't be the romance hero now I guess she's just the villain because mm -hmm. she's ugly like <laughs> um I think there's something really powerful about that and I think uh, not to not to degrade it into one little thing but there's this TikTok audio that's going around where a guy I think it's from a podcast, but a guy basically asks a woman, do you aspire to be liked by men? And she laughs and says no. And I think it's so funny. But at the same time, at the same time, I don't know that it's true. Like, I, I think we're constantly at war with I feel happy with myself, but other people don't feel happy with me. And therefore, I don't know that I can be happy with myself. And it's a cycle that feels unbreakable because because the only way to break it is to say, I don't care anymore. And I don't know that anyone can fully, fully, fully not care what society thinks of them. I, 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 yeah, like I, I agree. I think it's, I think it's really interesting. I, uh, once upon a time, a boy said to me that he thought I was objectively unattractive, but then he thought we would keep <laughs> having a date. And I oh, no. like, yeah, but at, at the time it was really hard for me to explain to him why that was so powerfully violent because as a woman mm. if I'm unattractive I have no value or right to exist because that's mm. the society we've been raised in and even though I as an individual person human being uh will say like I I want to be considered as a person first and a woman a very distant second um mm. and I and, and that's as much as I love womanhood I am myself first and yeah. how I conform to your gender standards a very different this is second <laughs> but at the same time I yeah absolutely I have formative trauma as um I mean like all women do of uh being made to feel that if I wasn't attractive, then I could be an object of violence and disdain. Like, yeah. and I am scared of that and I don't want that. But I also am furious with that. That's so unfair. That's so deeply yeah. cruel. That's so deeply violent to say that if I'm not a suitable enough sex object to stand in the room so that you can look at me, that I don't get to be a person with free will and a right to not suffer harm. Like what? Like it infuriates <laughs> me. And so what I what I love about Hester is that she struggles with this. She struggles with this anxiety privately. Yeah. She is also so angry about it. And when I said about the like the scarf, I think you make a very good point about the concealing. One of the things that's really interesting about Hester is there are multiple points in the book where she takes the scarf off, often mm. on purpose to tell someone she is not going to conform to what they're telling her to do. And she'll mm. be like, yeah, no, actually. I'm not going to do that. And, and the ways that she as a character in her personality, in her actions, very frequently behaves in a way that is 
violently antisocial because she doesn't care because this society isn't designed to let her live. And so she does not care in upholding that society. So she kills people. She betrays people. She lies. She leaves Tom. Like she leaves her child because she's like, I'm not the, the, the pet that you want me to be. I am a person and I am angry and I'm violent about the fact that so much violence has been done to me and I have a right to be angry and I have a right to be violent because in in the world that she exists in, violence is all done all the time and she has no less right to it because she's a woman. And one of the many, many things I love about the series is that you know, she's not always presented as heroic. She does bad things, but she's always presented as a person and a character. And Tom always loves her. Even when like, so the, the kind of timeline of their relationship is they they meet in the first book and at the end of the book, they get together and they really feel that they're in love. It's very much kind of an enemies to lovers slow burn. In the second book, Tom meets this super pretty princess and she's super traditionally attractive and she's skinny and she has long blonde hair. And Tom isn't cheating on Hester, but he's so selfish and so much of a boy who doesn't understand how these things work for women that he just stops spending time with her. He's just like, oh, but the princess wanted to spend time with me. So like, I'll come back to you in like a couple days. Like you can just like entertain yourself, right? And Hester keeps saying like, hey, I thought you cared about me. Could we maybe like talk to each other? Are you interested in spending time with me? Now you have a pretty girl to look at. And he ignores her and he ignores her and he ignores her until at the end of the book, she betrays him because she's like, okay, fine. I guess you've told me that the only way you will give me any of your time is if there isn't an alternative woman for you to look at. And that Mm. makes me feel inhuman. So fuck you. Um, So she betrays him. But then uh, he gets shot. It's a whole thing. Pennyroyal shoots him, actually, the bastard. Um, uh, Not on purpose, because Pennyroyal's incompetent. Um, And then in the third book, uh, it opens with, like, it's 10 years later. And one of the other things I found really interesting about these books growing up was you see the timeline of their relationship from them being teenagers to them being in their late 40s. So you kind of see them changing as they mature. Um, They have a kid together. Uh, the, and then at the start of the book, like the kid is 17 and Hester's just not a mum. She's just not a mum. She's just not a mum. She's never going to be a mum. And she leaves. She leaves the kids. She leaves her husband. Well, partner. Like, I don't know if they actually marry because it's a weird political situation. But it's a long story. Um, but uh, she leaves Tom. She leaves her kid. And it's really interesting to me because part of the reason she leaves is because Hester is an angry and violent person and she doesn't want to abuse her daughter. And she starts to realize that she cannot be this kind of docile, placid, patient figure of femininity. She just can't do that. She's she's a mercenary. She's a murderer. And she's like, okay, I'm not going to hurt you the way that people hurt me, but you are clearly much more like your father. You're soft and kind and touchy-feely. And I'm just not that. And I can't be that for you. And instead of exposing you to harm, I'm just going to leave. And so she leaves. And what's interesting as that goes on is that every time Tom and Hester encounter each other again, Tom loves her so deeply, but he understands that she can't stay. And, Mm. you know, she'll be like, okay, we're here again. And like, maybe they, you know, kiss, maybe they have sex, but then she leaves him. And he understands that he can't trap her because that's not the person that she is. Mm. And then in the final book, at the very, very, very end, they come back together again. And what's beautiful about it is that despite their deeply tumultuous relationship, they still love each other so much. And like, I think at this point, like Tom's like been with another woman for a while because Hester just wasn't around for years. Um, (laughs) And, you know, like Hester is kind of like, uh, there's been points where she's hated Tom, there's points where she's loved Tom, but like at the very end, they settle into this just deep love of each other. And one of the things I love about that whole relationship is the way that it, it taught baby me that love isn't you look at one person who's gorgeous and you're gorgeous and then instantly forever and ever you never have to talk to each other or communicate or try like Mm. it's that they have this deeply complicated relationship that takes work and takes negotiation and sometimes when it's not healthy for one of them they walk out because it's not good for them and they don't want to hurt each other and Mm. then they come back at a different time in their life when they've changed and they talk again and they make work because they want to love each other on purpose and they keep trying and there are other people who are affected by that relationship and when their daughter is affected by that relationship they work hard on purpose to be aware of the ways that they might be harming each other and their daughter and because they don't want to hurt her and then they think about it and they try and they try again and that love for me was so much more meaningful than like 
they saw each other and then found that it's love. <laughs> you know, just like love. It, no, 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 why? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and 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 yeah, and 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 that was really beautiful. It's also interesting because when you get to book three and four, the story becomes a lot about their daughter Ren, and she also falls in love with someone, a guy called Theo. And they also have a very complicated relationship where like there's there's parts of it where she's a teenager and and unlike Hester, she's like a pretty teenager and she really thinks of herself as being a kind of romance novel. Like Theo's very handsome, mm -hmm. but they have like a deeply complicated relationship also that goes backwards and forwards. And, and again, it's, it's just not simple. And there are multiple different romances and relationships in the book that are often told from the perspective of the woman. Well, they're told from both perspectives, but like they are often you know, they're explored and negotiated and navigated in really interesting ways that, that explore the ways in which like often cisgender heterosexual relationships for women can become violent very easily, not by the intention of the partner, but just because we live in a world with violent misogynistic standards. Um, mm. And uh, all of these different women negotiating their personhood and their partner's personhood. Yeah, it was just, yeah, it, re it really stuck with me. I've, I keep rambling. I just really love these books. No, this is, this is, <laughs> I, I, no, I think something that I think I really am grabbing onto listening to you talk about this is something that I don't think is in not just teen fiction, but a lot of fiction in general, which is women being written in a way that is complicated. Uh, women making choices that are morally wrong and still being allowed to be the hero of their story. Um, and I think, something that's really powerful about that especially encountering it as a teenager is that you you aren't making morally good choices you don't you don't see yourself as this person that says i know right from wrong and i'm only going to do right i think you know right from wrong but you often do wrong because it feels like the choice that you have to make you're emotional it's overwhelming and I think you can feel that way all the way through. It's not just when you're a teenage girl or when you're, when you're a teenager in general, um, gender non-exclusive. I think, I think people in general are selfish, which is why it's hard to not get to see women do that, especially if at that formative age, because I think it tells us, it reinforces that same standard of of impossible women that we are talking about when it comes to beauty. It it's the same in your behavior where we're saying if you want to be a person if you want to be a woman make sure that you also are are the type of person that can be looked at and fall in love with and be not complicated at all and instead i think it sounds like this huge formative book for you and something that you read growing up was basically saying no being a woman is just as complicated as being anything else and i think that there's something really really powerful in that and that we don't often get that choice like i i think a lot of women especially the or a lot of a lot of women characters especially in post-apocalyptic adventure novels are women who sort of have that Mary Sue element of them where like as much as I love the addition of Rey in Star Wars right so fun great great actress so much fun she walks in and just knows how to do everything she makes all the right choices she believes in in good over evil and is willing to sacrifice everything to do that that is the type of woman that you can look at and fall in love with and never have a problem with because she's not doing anything that would ever give you a problem to 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 have to work through um and something about that continues to make being a person feel unattainable because if the only way to participate in these fun narratives that I want to be a part of, like cool post-apocalyptic world where I get to beat people up, absolutely sign me up. But the only way you can fit into that world is by being someone who doesn't make choices, basically, or only makes choices that are good for the world and never really struggles. And I think regardless of age, but especially as a teenager, it, it is a constant struggle to just move from day to day, to go through a social interaction, to to make the choice to say, like, I don't know how to do this social interaction. So where do I go? I'll go to the library, I guess. And then to go to the library and read a bunch of books where they say, did you know you should also be pretty hot, funny and just enough sexual that you are appealing, but not so sexual that you're too you're putting it all out there and don't make any bad choices and also make sure you're putting other people first and morals are really important but not enough to not be interesting like to to seek refuge in books and then to find out that that refuge also just gives you more 
complicated feelings about being a woman and being young and being a mess. I really love this experience that you've had, which is basically here's a woman who is a mess and is is figuring it out, but making wrong choices and that. But but that doesn't make her unlovable. In fact, it makes her worth working to continue loving which you really, really like. Yeah, like, absolutely. Absolutely. And I mean, this is, this is you know, this is what I loved about Yennefer in season one of The Witcher, right? Like, it's, mm. it's, it's, what was so mind-blowing to me about her was that she gets to be this bad person who does good things and is complicated. Catra and she is another great example. Like, it, it's really yes. fun when you get complicated characters. And also, like, I think that this so often happens in, like, any minority representation. It's always weird to talk about women as a minority considering how many of us there are. But, like, <laughs> any minority representation talking about queerness or disability as well like um or anything like it's so often like if someone includes a minority in their thing they're like well but they're a paragon of virtue they're perfect mm. and they never make yeah. any mistake and it's like cool but i don't want that because i can't do that and what you're telling me is that i'm only allowed to be in the story if i'm perfect and that's deeply anxiety inducing and also dehumanizing just dehumanizing in a way that makes you think you're doing a good thing but like yeah. it's still dehumanizing you're not letting me be a human and humans make mistakes and are complicated and fail and by saying if i don't exist at this impossible standard I'm not a person you're making a statue not a person um yeah. but also like yeah like absolutely that's the thing in the books and I should say like in the books like Hester is not the only amazing female character in these books so you've got like Anna Fang who in the first book is just this incredible like freaking oh my god like freedom fighter ace pilot hero of the revolution has her own plane called the Jenny Hanover is this badass who turns up in an aviator jacket and like she's just she's so cool but then she you know at the end of the book she dies but then she's resurrected as because there's this resurrection thing in in the books it happens fairly rarely but she's resurrected and she becomes the series antagonist she is terrifying because mm. all of that intelligence and strategy and courage gets turned into an undying all-powerful soldier that has all of the memories of the previous civilization that killed itself so now oh. she's just <laughs> terrifying and she's furious because the part of her that remembers being Anna is so angry at the desecration of her body that she's mm. by by resurrecting her without her consent that she's like, okay, I'm just gonna burn you all. We're just gonna burn you all and start again. And then like as the books go on, she like has all of these like moments of humanity and atrocity until at the very end of the book, she's one of the reasons that the world is saved. And Hester saves the world. These complicated, flawed women save the world. Dr. Owen on Zero, she is this brilliant scientist, all of the most powerful characters in these books, all of the most complex and the ones who change the world, all of them are women and all of them mm. are flawed women. But Dr. Onan Zero, oh my goodness, she's basically Dr. Frankenstein. She figures out like revival technology in a way that no one else has done. Throughout the books, you know, she's a very different character to Anna and Hester. Anna and Hester are so bombastic and fighty and they're like, they're, they're courageous and they, 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 they go in with their fists. Zero is like very quiet and thoughtful, but terrifying because in a lot of ways she is also an antagonist, but she's also a hero. Like all three of them are heroes and villains at different points within the novels and within the series. Sometimes Zero, I mean, she's helping the war effort and the war effort, they do need to win because she is on the right side of the war, but like, but she's doing it in such a bad way. Like she's breaking so many deep moral <laughs> laws. Like, and, and, and but, but, but then again, at the end of the book, because of her own arc of recovery, she changes as a person. And like, all of them have these just deeply complex journeys. Ren starts off as this one dimensional, pretty heroic character. And then she's just a total dick at several different points like but but also i mean first of all it's just fun series of books it's just wildly imaginative wildly original the, the and just yeah the relationships the characters the prose like the actual writing of it is is so beautiful and, and evocative and compelling but also in terms of my own personal experience i I love science fiction. I love post-apocalypses. Um, I love just the world building. It just blew my mind. I, I couldn't have imagined such an original world um, at that point in my life. But also, um, I, I, I had an abusive childhood. I was, I was abused extensively um, and like criminally. And I, in, in that my life during those years, I was in so much pain and I was so sad but I was also I know scared so often but I was also so angry because it, it felt so unfair that that I had to that I had to lie to all of the adults in my life that I had to deal with being bullied and then going home and deal with violence there too that so much was expected of me and I had to be so obedient and do all of these things right for these people who were hurting me all the time 
but because I was being abused, I didn't, I wasn't allowed to feel anger. I wasn't allowed to have facial expressions that express anger. I think at one point, like my dad said that I wasn't allowed to use the word no. Like I couldn't ever in any way contradict any kind of social standard. And then I was at this Catholic boarding school where I was being told that because women are evil, we get periods and we suffer. And I have endometriosis. So I was throwing up in pain and I was being told it was because of how inherently evil I was as a person, as a woman. So I had this just like building, building, building frustration and anger at the just sheer like injustice of it all. Mm. And to read these books where all of these different women are charismatic and intelligent and heroic and courageous and flawed and furious and grieving and ugly and loved and admired and respected and beloved and fascinating and world changing was just this like absolute like solace for me that there was there was in theory in in my imagination a world where i was allowed to be angry that i'd been hurt and i could still be loved and they're really good books <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna cry i i think i i i really think what you're describing is exactly what people making media hope to do and i think there's something so so powerful about what you're talking about because ultimately it's not just feeling less alone, which I think is a great goal in making media, but it's saying that things are bad in life. And it's not this idea of it gets better, which I think sometimes can ring a little hollow when you're going through it. It's not this idea that you'll get over it because you're not going to. It, you'll move forward, but there's a difference between moving forward and and not having something or trauma bother you it, it still exists it's still a part of your dna and what you're describing is this idea that it's not necessarily going to get better it might be hard forever but that doesn't mean that you're less of a person and what it actually means is that someone one day is going to see all of that to see the scars to see the trauma to understand you as a person and to understand everything that makes you up not just the parts that you're hiding behind that red scarf and they're still going to love you. And I think that is that is so much more powerful than it gets better. That is so much more powerful than you'll get over it or time heals all wounds or things get easier, which all of those things feel like I want to punch you in the face when you say it to me because <laughs> right now things suck and it feels like they're going to suck forever. And it also feels like because they suck and they're happening to me, I suck and I'm going to suck forever. And what's more powerful of that is, yeah, it is. It does suck. It is affecting you. It will affect you forever. This is part of who you are. But that means that someone will love you for that and someone will love every part of you. And I think that is incredibly strong and incredibly powerful. And um, I will obviously be reading these books. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they're really good. They're really good. <laughs> <laughs> Convert. Um you know, something that I think is interesting about all of this, though, because so much of this conversation is about womanhood and also about the trauma that women experience from a society run by men. And I'm curious about how you feel about the fact that it's written by a man and the fact that it seems to, unlike a lot of other other media written by men where women are centric, it, it seems to really understand that experience. Yeah. So I... I've got this whole thing where these books are so sacred to me that I've really made a specific point of never looking too much into Philip Reeve because yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't want that to ruin my experience of these books. Um, yeah. I, I, I do my due diligence in that I check that he's not like a massive bigot. Um, and he's not like he's 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 cool, but like um, but I don't really want to know too much about him as an individual person because what I know about him is what he told me in his books. And that was mm. the place that I, I needed to learn. I think it's interesting that now as an adult, I am much more interested in reading books by like women, trans people and people who aren't white because I've read enough books by white guys to last me a lifetime. Like I don't really need any more. Um, so I think nowadays I probably wouldn't even pick up the book in the shop. Like I wouldn't pick up the book in a library. I'd be like, eh. But as a kid, I think there was something safe about the idea. Yeah, I, I make the joke a lot that I'm a feminist because I believe men are people. 
Um, <laughs> and I, I, I say that because I think a lot of misogyny holds on to this idea that men are not thinking, feeling adults who have free will. Like mm. that they they couldn't help themselves but do this horribly violent thing to a woman. That they just don't realize the ways in which they torment women through social standards and 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 and, and all of these other things. And I have known so many men who are people that I actually expect all men to be people. And that mm. means to think and exercise compassion and control yourself. And if you can't do that, then either you're an animal, but I don't think that's true, or you're a person who's doing this on purpose, mm. which is your responsibility and you need to fix it. And I'm not saying that like every man who ever says something by accident that's sexist is on purpose trying to torment women, because that's ridiculous. <laughs> we live in a society and that society is misogynistic. Yeah. But what I am saying is that as a thinking, feeling person, we all have an obligation to at least try to be kind to our fellow human being. And part of that means listening and part of that means learning. And if you're not making an effort to listen or learn ever, then yeah, maybe I am holding you a little bit accountable. Mm. Um, all that is to say with Philip Reeve, he's one of the people who reminds me that men are people. Mm. I, I find like this enormous reassurance and safety in the idea that like a white cis man could understand and think about these things so deeply and could care about these things so deeply and could write them so compassionately because that means that any man could do that and that is a source actually of enormous hope to me the idea that that we could be that kind to each other we could give each other that much thought and respect and care and I think that that's a good thing. And as a kid, I think there was like an element of like, he is the authority because he's a man. And there's something reassuring about the idea of an authority who sees me as an equal, who is worthy of respect and all of my emotions, not just the ones that I've been told I'm allowed to have. Yeah, I think um, we talked slightly about this uh, before we started recording, but the idea that as much as we want people who look like us to be standing up and making these narratives and to write books that say women are whole people or <laughs> that um, exp it, that uh, can explore those experiences in a um, sort of own voices way, there is unfortunately something very powerful about someone who's at the top of the power struggle or sort of power dynamics saying, okay, but women are people um, and they're complicated and, and it's all of, and you know, they're complicated and they're angry. And I, I think, fortunately or unfortunately, when people who are at that level of being able to be at the top of everything and being able to sort of make decisions without those same risks that people who are not at the top of the power dynamics or power sort of, I don't know what I'm, I'm sort of like, like imagining a pyramid and there's a man standing on top of it, <laughs> looking down at everyone else who needs help. Um, but there's something very powerful in that because unfortunately both those who are like us and and look at it and say okay well that's an authority figure and he believes it so it's a little more true um but also people who are on the same level of, as him that m might not pick up a book written by a woman or written by um a, a person from a disabled group or all of those different things sometimes putting that guy who can go on the press tour and then guys can go, oh, well, I like that guy and I like apocalypses and I would like to read it. Sometimes that means that those people are going to have their minds changed a little bit um, because they're reading something that feels familiar to them. But then they're like, whoa, who are these who are these women? And I, I obviously it's not about those people reading this that book. That's not what this episode is about. It's about your experience. But I do think sometimes there's a, something a little bit powerful in being able to say that the same experience you had with this book and the same sort of feelings that you realize are valid to have are also maybe the feelings that someone your age at the time as a boy who is becoming a person and and having their brain coded as well looks at it and says, well, I guess women don't have to be beautiful to be valuable. I guess women are angry. And yeah, it was totally fucked up that this thing happened to her. It is wrong that violence is being perpetrated against women. I think it can it can go both ways. It can make us feel seen and it can also make people at the top feel like, well, now I understand. I get it a little bit. And sometimes that means it has to come from someone who's on that level of, oh, there's a guy's name on this book and it looks like uh, a cool action novel. I think representation is important across the board that way. Yeah, I yeah. agree.
<laughs> um, I do want to talk a little bit about this idea of anger. I think it's really interesting to me that this book sort of made you feel like it was okay to be angry because I don't know that we talk about that very much. Um, I think we talk about being scared or being sad or feeling small, but anger is an overwhelming emotion. And I think it's a real one um, that we don't talk about enough. Was that depiction of anger on the page something that made you feel like you had to stop maybe, I, I don't want to say you stopped hiding the fact that you were angry, but that made you feel like maybe it was more valid and at some point you could express that? Yeah, for sure. Like, I think, um, so the way that abuse worked for me came with a lot of like gaslighting and compliance and, you know, being told that my feelings or thoughts weren't valid or that what was happening to me wasn't abusive or that if I thought it was, then I was going to ruin my brother's life, my little brother's life. And what that meant was that I was very, very scared of being angry. And that in combination with quite deep Catholic trauma due to like a, a, a very abusive school um, and, and church meant that I, I also felt that even thinking anger w was bad, that, that I couldn't even think or feel it because there's, there's, a, there's a part of Catholicism, a very unhealthy part that says, even if you have the thought, it's the same as doing the sin. As so well as like, I can't even let myself think that I'm angry. And what that ended up doing was make me deeply, deeply suicidally depressed. Um, when I was first diagnosed with clinical depression, the doctor was pretty sure that I'd been suicidally depressed since I was 11 years old. I spent most of my life suicidally depressed. I tried to kill myself more than once and the first time was when I was 14. Um, and no one knew uh, because I couldn't tell anyone. Um, and I called like a helpline and they talked me down from being in a window trying to jump out of it. Therefore, to answer your question about anger, what was really interesting about these books was that it meant that there were moments in my life where I remembered that I was allowed to be angry. And I would, for example, confront my parents and say, you're not supposed to do this. You're not allowed to do this. I don't think this is right. I don't think you're supposed to be doing this. Mm. And I think that if I hadn't ever felt able to do that, I wouldn't be alive because I would have just laying down and laying down and laying down until I agreed that the world was better off if I was dead and my family was better off if I was dead and there was nothing I could do to escape the pain or the fear except for lie down and let it happen. And reading these books, I was in such a deeply traumatized and unhealthy place that like at the time I definitely didn't actively go, Hester is angry, therefore I can be angry. But I think what it meant was that over the years, I grew up as an adult into an adult who felt very strongly that it is an inalienable human right to feel anger when violence is done against you. Mm. I feel that very, very, very powerfully about discrimination now. Like of all, in all its forms, you, I am allowed to be angry. Um, and it's important that I'm allowed to be angry. It's important that we are all allowed to be angry. And I think in part, I learned that from Hester Shaw, for sure. I, I think that that's the thing about fiction is that you don't always, I think, directly line up the dots, especially when you're a kid, but you internalize those lessons and those ideas and they bake into you in a way that like for me means that when something bad is happening to me, I turn around as I, I don't think you should do that or I try to defend myself. And maybe it doesn't work, but the fact that I tried is something that I hold on to for the next few months or years. And then every subsequent time it happens, I know that, that I can do it. I could defend myself. I could disagree. And that keeps me going and makes me think that I don't have to give up and I don't have to surrender because I because I know that there's a part of me that can do it, that can fight, that could escape, that can be brave. And I think we need fiction so that people know those things. I think I think we need fiction so that people who can't do that in real life at the moment for whatever reason know that they are allowed to feel those things, that they are allowed to do those things, that they are allowed to protect themselves, that they are allowed to be upset at the way they've been treated. And to rehearse that in fiction, that when you're reading a book and a character's doing it, you are rehearsing the emotions, the idea, you're, you're daydreaming about what it would feel like. You're giving yourself that practice run of like, 
okay, if Hester leaves, what does it look like if I leave? Like, um, And you're not consciously thinking about it necessarily, but you just get to have that moment of an echo. And sometimes that's all you need is just that echo, just that inkling. Like I love dystopian fiction. I love post-apocalypses. I think they're really interesting. But one of the things that I really love about fiction um, that people like Ursula Kayla Gwynn talk about is that the point of fiction is, is, is um, it, it was uh, the way she phrased it in her national book award speech, is like visionaries of a larger reality. People who can give us like a, a way of imagining what a future could look like that's different to what we live in now. And I think that's true on like a global political scale with, with utopian and dystopian science fiction. But I also think that's true on an individual scale. Sometimes you need to, to read a book that helps you imagine the idea of life looking differently to what it looks like now. Mm. And if you're being abused, if you are trapped in an unhealthy or dangerous situation, it says, what if you lived in a world where that wasn't happening? Like for me, not just with Mortal Engines, I remember reading the Percy Jackson books and thinking that Percy's mom couldn't possibly be real because parents who loved their kids didn't exist. I really thought that was a Hollywood myth. I very sincerely was convinced that every single child who had ever lived was treated with enormous violence and cruelty. I used to tell myself that like in the Victorian poorhouse you got flogged and I'm not being whipped so it can't be that bad. I used to think that in the same way that like lights coming on a music in a TV show was fake, the parent giving their kid a hug and being like, I love you and it's okay that you made a mistake. That was just fake. That wasn't real. Percy Jackson's mum doesn't really act like that. That's just an exaggeration for fiction because this is young adult fiction. It's not real. But reading that book planted that little seed of chaos in my head that was like, but what if you did have a family who said it was okay if you made a mistake and didn't hurt you and you weren't scared of? Like, and that meant that I was able to later like escape and become a free person who is alive and has done therapy and makes shows and works in media and is kind of doing like my dream career. Because books gave me those tiny, tiny little inklings of like, hey, like it could be different. Yeah, I think I talk about this a lot and I I found it um, really intense when I was at film school, which was that every once in a while, I think people who make media have this conversation about whether or not you're you should be doing something more worthwhile to the world. Right. Um, and I think that comes into conversation when you're talking about things that feel like big genre pieces that are more mass market. I think I and I, I knew a lot of people like this and I, I struggled with it as well when people would have these conversations, which was the idea that um, I had someone that I went to college with say, like, I have to leave and major in something that could actually change the world. I think something that I've really enjoyed talking about this show is that media actually can save lives. And I think what's really important about that is realizing that if everyone were a doctor or a lawyer or a politician or someone who, who's who's saving the environment, like all of those things are very important, but those people need to also be able to come home and not think about that, first of all. But second of all, to get to be those people, they need those moments where they can believe that there is a world that can be changed. And I think without media and without fiction, as a whole, there is not that understanding in your core that not only does the world exist, but it could be better. And as the hero of that story, I could change it. And I think the more, especially watching you then go into making media yourself, that I personally think a lot of the media you've done does have that same feeling of there is a better world for you and you can get there, Um, which it's not saying like mortal the mortal engines isn't saying just so you know one day there is a better world and you can have it and percy jackson isn't saying just so you know some people experience love it's saying here's a version of the world where that happens and if you read enough of it you'll start to believe that that world could be your world and here's how i could establish that world and make that world a success for other people and so i think sometimes we forget how important that part of it is and that you don't become the person that believes that or that can get through hard times or that makes it through life in general, just stays alive to keep li- to keep doing things without feeling like you've seen that or that that fiction has given you that as an understanding. And it's not 
this, here's this book, your life has now changed. It's here's this book and every time you read it and every time you think about it, it makes you think that things could be better. And I think also something that's powerful about this one in particular and your story is that it's not just things could be better. It's that you as a person, the way you exist now, what you're feeling is valid. And those feelings are the things that can make it better. If you allow yourself to feel anger and stand up for yourself and do something with that anger, that's what can make it better. That's what can give you this world that you want to see. And I I just think it's really beautiful every time I talk to someone that can say, here's that piece of media that did that for me. And I just think fiction is just, it's just so important for that explicit reason. And I think it does change lives. And I think I, I've taken time to to really get to that as I'm like, oh, I love making, I want to make big old superhero movies. But like, <laughs> and what does that really do? But then you have to take the moment and say, well, what did, what did that superhero movie do for you? Like, how did you get here? And, and what can you give as a gift to, some, to someone else who needs it? But yeah, well, you know, one thing I, I do want to talk about with you is, uh, in particular, a piece of media that you've made that I think gives that to other people. Um, and maybe that's me speaking for myself, but, <laughs> but I do think you've found a way, uh, to do that in this piece of media, which is uh, Doctor Who Redacted. And there's so much that I want to talk to you about it. But the (laughs) one thing I want to start with is one of the things you mentioned early on in this episode is that you never felt the need to engage in fandom with Mortal Engines because it felt perfect on the page and that your experience with fandom has been, oh, I wish I could have changed that. I wish I could fix that. Um, What was your relationship with Doctor Who before you got to actually change something about the canon? Oh my gosh, I wrote I wrote so much fan fiction. I wrote so much fan fiction. <laughs> I wrote over 250,000 words of Doctor Who fan fiction. Oh my god. I the first fan art that anyone ever did for my writing was for Doctor Who fan fiction. I was obsessed with Doctor <laughs> Who. Um and yeah, like I think that there was a Doctor Who has many strengths and also sometimes weaknesses because it is a media property which is written by many people and people are human. And I and th- there were definitely times when I think the thing about the Doctor is that they're such an infinitely changing character that everyone feels that their personal headcanon of how the Doctor works as a person is the right one. And everyone is right because the Doctor is thousands of years old and has been all of these people. Um, <laughs> and you know, so like my Doctor, like. Or uh, how I imagine the Doctor isn't specifically like, you know, Tennant or Smith or even Jodie, but like the person that exists throughout the regenerations, like my version of that Doctor is the one that I would write fan fiction about. And and, and that person, it's a bit different to canon in some ways um, at different points in the timeline. Um, and, 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 you know, like also just stuff of, it was interesting actually, because for example, I'm deeply into the Dragon Age fandom at the moment. Okay. Oh my goodness, there is so much wrong with that franchise. <laughs> I like I, I always kind of describe it as like you know if you've got if you imagine like a little like square grid like with a cross in the middle and like at the top is good because I like it and the bottom is bad because I hate it and good is in well constructed and bad is in poorly constructed Dragon mm-hmm. Age is all four of those things at the same time at all times like it's great <laughs> I love it but I also hate it but it's great as in it's really well done but also it's really badly done and I it drives me it drives me to distraction um so there's a lot of I literally wrote like a fictional manifesto for Dragon Age because I was so frustrated at, at, at how at how Dragon Age worked. With Doctor Who, I think it was more, um, there was some gender stuff. I wouldn't dare to say, but I feel like perhaps it might be observed that occasionally under different writers, there were some perhaps failures in the representation of women at certain points. But since I have worked for the brand, I Cannot really comment, uh, but <laughs> very um, very uh, diplomatic approach. But I <laughs> I think we can read between the lines. <laughs> um, but so you know, like I was I was really interested in writing women in in Doctor Who in my fan fiction. Um, but I also think interestingly with my Doctor Who fan fiction, it was a lot actually just an exercise as a writer. Like each of my chapters mm. was essentially kind of a monster of the week episode. And mm. I found it really interesting creating like different worlds and aliens and scenarios and mysteries. I remember that long story, I've moved like 35 times in 28 years. And for a while I lived in Hong Kong. Because I lived in Hong Kong for a while, I'd been to a lot of East Asia because uh, my dad was a pilot. And mm. um, 
one of my storylines was set in a kind of like future human society where um, Malaysia was the kind of, and Malaysian culture was like the primary culture. And I modeled kind of all of the like clothing, food, architecture and stuff around Malaysian culture. Um, and I don't know how well or badly I did that. I was a white 15 year old, probably not well, but like, uh, <laughs> the, but I, but I remember it was, it was kind of like one of the first moments where someone wrote something about my writing that really struck me where like someone read the fic and was like, oh, I'm Malaysian. And this is the first time that I've ever read a story where they've imagined a future human society where Malaysia is in charge because, you know, normally it's America or right. England or America okay. or <laughs> England or America. Um, and that that was really interesting to me. And I, I became really interested in the idea of like all the different ways in which you could like remix contemporary culture using Doctor Who um, mm. through like alien society and the future and sci-fi, but also his history and, and all the different metaphors. And, you know, also I was queer and I was figuring out queerness and... Yeah. You know, R.I.P. John Barrowman's reputation and decency. But as a kid in this deeply Catholic school, and with everything I've mentioned about like growing up, I had no idea what queerness was or bisexuality was, and I was like very queer and bi. And Captain Jack was the first time I encountered the concept of bisexuality, and so there was also queerness in my fanfic. But like in a way where I didn't know what queerness was, where I was just like, just gonna spend an entire chapter talking about how pretty Amy is from the perspective of the doctor. This is a very straight and heterosexual thing to do. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, like, I, I, I think it was, it was a lot about figuring myself out whilst I was writing fan fiction, but, but it was also about this thing that I think the doctor and Doctor Who does so well. And is part of the reason that it attracts so many kind of gays and miscreants is, is just that the doctor loves you no matter what, like the doctor mm. doesn't care if you have 16 tentacles, the doctor doesn't care if you emit poisonous ooze, the doctor <laughs> cares about you and thinks that everyone should be cared about and respected. And for me as like a baby, weird, you know, neuro divergent, very bullied, queer, abused young woman, the idea that the doctor would meet me and not see me as like base or lesser or disgusting, but would just be like, oh, that's a person and I'm going to talk to her as a person mm. was a source of immense solace and comfort to me. And that was the comfort blanket that I wrote in pretty much every chapter of my fan fiction was the doctor finding someone and being like, huh, you're different to me and I care about you and respect you and I'm going to help you because I'm kind. Mm. And then just doing that again. And every time I wrote that, kind of doing that for myself and, and, and writing for myself, the idea that the doctor meets you and is kind and helps you and then does it again and then does it again and then does it again um, was... Yeah, like I, I think I think a lot of the time we write fan fiction as therapy, and this was definitely a way that I, I reassured myself as a coping mechanism, um, yeah. and was highly effective. And I wrote yeah. just so much fan fiction. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, no, I think I think the core concept with Doctor Who, and we did a whole episode on Doctor Who with David K. Barnes, who also has a similar experience where he loved Doctor Who and now has written Doctor Who, um, which is just such a, a wild, wild transition. I think that core thing is there is someone out there who will love you for who you are. And and also, I think Doctor Who has this one extra piece of it, which will which is the doctor, I think, finds people interesting and wants to know more about them and it's not always this I love you it's because you get these characters where it is one episode where he cares deeply for them but a lot of times it's because he want he's there's this this itch that he wants to scratch you're interesting let's talk more um and there is something about that attention <laughs> that it feels just so desirable and so um so like it does need to be in sci-fi because Let's see how many off how, how how often people are kindly interested in you in the real world. But that feeling of you're different from me, you're interesting and intriguing, and I want to know more about you. And by learning more about you, I care for you and want to help you move forward in life. I think that feeling is just is just such a part of the brand in such a great way. So how do you go from being someone who loves that feeling and writes a quarter of a million words in, <laughs> in your own world online to getting to officially bring a story like that into the canon? Like this is real. It happened. 
Yeah, I know. It's wild. I'm still it's hard to believe. Uh, uh, good Lord. Uh, well, I mean, first of all, got a job in media. That wasn't easy. Um, <laughs> it took me, I think, about six years to get my first paid job in media and a master's degree, which I took out a loan for. And I mean, it's nothing like an American student loan, but it's still like £50,000 of debt, which I am dealing with, which isn't great for me. Um, but um, yeah, like I, I, I got my degree and then as you know, Marissa, from our work in audio drama, I have just been obsessed with audio drama for a really long time. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I started listening to fiction podcasts in 2012, um, obsessed over them, decided that I wanted to work in media, couldn't afford to do that. Uh, did like a bunch of different jobs and then eventually like took out a loan and went to London and did a master's degree in radio. And uh, whilst I was there, I was everyone's favorite student because I volunteered to do an extracurricular lecture for my peers on uh, <laughs> audio drama where I made a PowerPoint presentation and lectured them for 25 minutes. So you're really graduating from being bullied, I see. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, these days everyone loves me and no one finds me annoying. <laughs> Um, but so I did that and then I, uh, was at a networking event with, uh, a guy who used to work for the BBC who is Irish and I'd just seen to, been to see a play called Translations by Brian Friel, which is one of the best plays of the 20th century. And, uh, it's all about like the English occupation and cultural genocide of Ireland. And I felt very strongly about it because it was a real good play. And I was quite drunk and didn't know who this person was, except that he was Irish and also interested in plays. So I just spent about, I want to say 45 minutes yelling at him about this play. And <laughs> then at the end of that, he was like, you know, if you feel this strongly about plays, do you ever listen to audio drama? And I was like, boy, howdy, are we in for another 45 <laughs> minutes? Um, and as I was ranting, I was like, you know, actually, I... Uh, I volunteered to do this lecture for my class. <laughs> um, if you want to read my PowerPoint. <laughs> and he was like, well, do you want me to like pay you to come give that to the BBC? And I was like, I beg your pardon? Because um, at this point it was midnight and I had a lot of beer. Um, and he goes, yeah, no. So I'm like the commissioner of BBC Sounds, which is this new podcast app, which is about to launch. And we really need someone who knows about audio drama. So do you want to like come give us a lecture? And I was like, okay. Um, and... Then I, I did that and then I was invited to come back and it was like the same day that I was, I got offered a job at like a sports warehouse because I just needed some money that I was like, the BBC was like, hey, do you want to just like come do this thing instead? And I was like, said to the shop, I was like, I'm really sorry, but I got to go do this thing. Um, and then in 15 working days with no resource at all, no accommodation, I was couch surfing, no expenses. I wrote a 140 page overview of the last 10 years of the English language fiction podcast industry with just like Google. And uh, of that, 40 pages was made public by BBC Sounds. And I put a lot of caveats into that report being like, hey, this was written <laughs> with caffeine and the internet. So please don't assume that it's 100% accurate. Um, yeah. But uh, it continues to be the most like comprehensive overview of our industry because no one else has done one more recently. So um, that kind of like made my name a bit. And then from there, I ended up giving my PowerPoint presentation to all of the major network commissioners of TV and radio at the BBC. And then from there, got invited to give that same lecture to BBC Studios, which is a production company. Uh, and off the back of that, I was invited to apply for a job as a producer, which I got um, as in part of their radio, well, what was formerly their radio comedy team and is now their audio team because they don't just do comedy, theoretically. In amongst all this, at some point, I mentioned to that Irish guy whose name is Jason Phipps. Look, Jason, I am very excited to be working for the BBC. That's very cool for me. If I ever had the chance to work on a Doctor Who thing, I would be grateful to you forever. And I just, I kind of meant it as a joke. I mean, I meant it sincerely, but I wasn't being like, you have to make me do a Doctor I didn't think that that was really yeah. practical. I just, just like, you know, like that would be my dream thing to do. And then... A few months later, I get invited to this meeting and no one tells me what the meeting is about. And my boss is there and Jason is there. Some people I don't know are there. And as they're like introducing everyone, everyone's saying like their names and their jobs and stuff. Uh, someone's like, oh yeah, so this is the meeting where we're going to pitch the Doctor Who podcast. And I was like, what? Um, and I had a notebook and I still have this notebook somewhere. It looks like an absolute serial killer diary where like in the five minutes whilst everyone's introducing themselves and saying what they do, I'm like coming up with podcast ideas for Dr. Who. <laughs> and I'm being like, oh, well, I really hope I'm going to pitch okay in this five minutes that I've had to prepare during the meeting. 
Um, and then we go around the room and everyone kind of suggests their ideas and I pitch a couple of ideas, but one of them is simply like Buzzfeed Unsolved, but Doctor Who, because I think that that would be funny and also good. Like, I think it would be good. We had like a couple of strictures, which I had to bear in mind whilst I was writing down my lightning fast pitches, which were like, you know, they wanted it to appeal to women under 35, specifically working class women, because they felt that of all of the kind of Doctor Who expanded properties, there wasn't really anything that served that particular audience. And they wanted to make something for that audience. There were also a lot of strictures about what we could and couldn't do in regards to the brand, because there often are when you're working with these big brands. And this one was like, it was quite strict. Like we couldn't have interviews behind the scenes with the cast and crew. We couldn't uh, like at that point do a kind of like live in relation to the TV show thing. So it was like, we needed to have something that was the official Doctor Who podcast that was interesting enough to be the official Doctor Who podcast, but also didn't have access to a lot of things that typically companion shows have access to. So I, I was like, well, well, we should do this. Uh, we could do an audio drama. Um, and specifically, you know, Big Finish exists, which is a, a big Doctor Who audio drama maker. Uh, but I, I, I think it's, it's not untrue to say that like Big Finish tends to appeal to like an older, whiter, more masculine audience. And I was like, what if we made an audio drama for like a different audience? Um, and one that was freely available because Big Finish you have to pay for. And also one that was funny. Um, I'm a comedy producer. I like making comedy drama specifically. And I, I, I thought like, you know, making a comedy drama, because I think what's good about Doctor Who is that it's scary and funny. And I, I really wanted something that had that sense of humor. Um, anyway, they were interested enough that I like got to write this like two page little A4 document which had like a screen cap of Ryan and Shane from BuzzFeed Unsolved <laughs> and it was just like yeah this um and that got circulated for like six months and then eventually someone was interested enough they were like okay I'll give you some cash you can go commission a writer to write the pilot now up until this point I didn't even have a writer I didn't have a storyline apart from like the general vibes um and so I contacted Juno Dawson because she'd written the first book for the 13th Doctor which was called The Good Doctor and I met her for coffee and like pitched her on doing this podcast. She never even like, she'd written some audio dramas for Big Finish for Torchwood. That was the other reason that I talked to her because I knew she could write audio. Um, but like the idea of like a drama podcast rather than a Big Finish was like a little confusing to her. Um, and I was like, trust me, it'll be real good. I promise. <laughs> um, and, you know, as we're talking, we both get like more and more excited and interested in the idea of this podcast led by these three women. The idea of like one of them being trans, the idea of having them be like ideally queer, women of color, telling a story from the perspective of people who don't get as much screen time in Doctor Who. Yeah, by, by the end of the meeting, we were both really invested and interested in like these characters. Uh, so then we went and had a writer's room where we kind of plotted out, well, I say a writer's room. I got two other writers for very little money to sit in a meeting room for two hours with a whiteboard <laughs> and we roughly plotted out the series, which is not what we would traditionally consider a writer's room, but it's what we're calling a writer's room. And we made the pilot, uh, we had fun and it was recorded in a terrible studio because it was free. Um, and we put it together and uh, people really liked it. Um, BBC Sounds really liked it. Doctor Who really liked it. Then a pandemic happened. And also it was announced that Chris Chibnall was leaving Doctor Who. And mm. so we had kind of two big things in our way. One of them being the change of showrunners because like it maybe made sense for Chibnall's era, but we weren't sure how Russell would feel about it. There was like maybe going to be a gap between them. I didn't know that Russell was going to be the incoming showrunner for a really long time. So I didn't know who it was going to be or when they were going to be appointed. So it was just, it had to be on ice until that was all decided. So basically it ended up taking like three years. And then in December of 2021, <laughs> I was asked to, you know, make a deck. And it was during Christmas. It was during the Christmas holiday. I was like at my friend's house, um, make a deck to convince BBC Sounds that young people are interested in Doctor Who, which they felt could not be proven. Uh, really? <laughs> which I'm just going to present as a neutral piece of information. But anyway, I made the deck um, and uh, was like, you know, this is why I think young people might be interested in Doctor Who. And this is why I think that people would be interested in our show. And off the back of that deck, finally in January 2022, when this had originally been pitched in like March 2019, um, they were like, okay, uh, we want you to make the series. And in in that, this was at the end of January this year. They said, we want you to make the series and we want the first episode to be made and released and the entire series to be released in April. So then we had three months to write, record, produce and release a 10-part audio drama series for Doctor Who, which is 
quite a tight turnaround. Um, uh, if you know anything about audio drama. I'm cringing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And also like cast like celebrities in three months, um, uh, including Jodie Whittaker in three months. Um, but like uh, we did it. Um, and, and we turned it around um, and yeah, the, the rest is public. So, you know, I'll stop there. But yes, that, that, that's how. <laughs> I, well, what I, what I love about that is that it, it all stems out of you being violently, openly passionate about being a fan <laughs> of things in general. There's something I think uh, to be learned from not hiding that fandom. I mean, obviously it's a balance. I <laughs> try to respect like parasocial boundaries. But on the other hand, yeah, like, I mean, I think I have one friend who says that I'm a professional enthusiast and mm. I have another friend who says that I specialize in unpopular media, um, <laughs> but both of which are true. Uh, but I, I, I think, hope, choose to believe. Um, that my neurodivergence and my my autism, my ADHD is is kind of a superpower for me. Sometimes it is deeply disabling and very frustrating and painful. And I don't say this flippantly, um, but I I can't lie. Mm. I'm very bad at lying. I, I find generally masking very difficult and I find interpreting emotions very difficult. But the thing that I am especially bad at is lying. And therefore... I don't really have a choice but to be openly and sincerely enthusiastic about something if I am openly and sincerely enthusiastic about it because I can't lie. So <laughs> it's like, you know, essentially imagine just living your whole life under a truth spell. And I think I think some people like appreciate that. I think especially in media because I can be quite blunt and quite direct. But I think that people always know if I'm directing an actor, for example, if I tell them I think it was good, they know I mean it because I wouldn't say it if I didn't. Um, and they know that. And it's not that I'm a dick to them, but it's just that, you know, what. I'm sincerely enthusiastic. And if we haven't got that yet, then we'll keep working and we'll figure it out. That's fine. Um, but like I, yeah, as a producer, as a director, when I'm working with these properties, yeah, I have to admit that I like them. Um, also, a really nice thing I found about specifically Doctor Who is that a lot of the people who work behind the scenes on Doctor Who are massive fans and talk about that. Like in most of the meetings I had about Redacted, we're all geeking out about various Doctor Who references, you know, like our editors being like, hey, we could also add this additional reference. Like, this is going to make us all very happy. We're all getting very excited about, like, all of these different parts of the show that we've all very deeply cared about. Um, I got, like, free merch from the show because I wanted it. And, so, you know, <laughs> like, someone who worked at Doctor Who was like, hey, we've actually just got this shirt coming out with, like, the TARDIS on it. Do you want, like, one of them? Because I can give you one. And I was like, yes, please, yes. I do. <laughs> like, um, you know, so I, 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 I think like Doctor Who especially really embraces enthusiasm and fandom because so many of the people who work on it are deep fans of the show. But also for me personally, I I can't really call it a strategy because I, ju I just don't have a choice. It's just, that is how I work as a person. I don't think that should be a bad thing. I, I feel mm. very strongly that, just as a side note, because I guess we're talking a lot about misogyny and feminism. Um, <laughs> you know, there's a myth that women are emotional and men are rational. Mm. That is objectively untrue. Uh, but also another part of that is the idea that being emotional is inherently intellectually and artistically lesser than being mm. rational. And S. Le Guin's got some great essays about the inherent irrationality of attempting to apply logic to illogic, which is fiction. Like you cannot break a story into numbers because that's not how that works. And if you think you can, you are deluded and you are not being objective. Like in, in the philosophical sense, you are not being logical. Emotions are profoundly important. And psychologically, we are more likely to remember information when we feel about it, which means that people who are emotional know more, literally. Mm. That's it. So. The idea that emotions are bad or inappropriate or unprofessional ultimately comes from a deeply toxic patriarchal world myth that is designed to oppress women. So I disagree with it on principle. And as part of that, I have no shame and in fact, quite a defiant sort of recalcitrance about being very deliberately emotional and a professional. Like, yes, I am a producer and director and I am in charge 
and I am excited. And I am allowed to be all of those things at once because I'm a person with feelings. And also I disagree with the idea that emotions make me worse at my job. I think they make me better. So I will be enthusiastic and I cannot choose to be otherwise. But I also think that being enthusiastic as a woman in my industry who enjoys a lot of privilege in a lot of different directions because I'm white, because I'm middle class, whatever, I think it's good to get real excited and jump up and down. But, you know, in the right venue. <laughs> in the right venue, with the in the right way. No, I I uh, I think that is actually a perfect thing to kind of tie back to mortal engines and 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 our episode, which is that being able to express feeling emotions that are overwhelming is really important. Um, and so I think because we talked so much about that existing with Hester and with the other female characters in Mortal Engines and how that played into their story, I think I am going to ask you our final question that I ask everyone, which is if you had never sort of happened upon Mortal Engines, if you had skipped that shelf in the library and you had never read that quartet of books, what would be different about you today? I think I'd be a lot less brave. Hmm. I think, I think I would be much more scared and much more sad and much more alone, and possibly not here at all. And I think that would be because I felt too scared to live, to feel, to fight. Um, yeah. Well, I, I personally am very glad that those books found you when they did, because I think something that is really beautiful is the fact that they did keep you here and they did also give you space to become the person that you are today. And I think that person is actively making things better for the people behind her. So I I hate to use something cheesy like pay it forward or something like that. But I I think something I've really loved about this episode is listening to how these books not only changed something for you, but gave you a desire to have that change for other people and that you've been moving through life in a way that does that for other people and making media that does that for other people and sort of putting your dent in in the society <laughs> to, to end it on a sort of lighter note um but i am very glad that uh that you didn't skip that shelf i'll say it that way um thank you Thank you. Well, th truly, thank you so much for for being on today and and for sharing as much as you have and sharing your story and honestly for making me run to the bookstore after this interview. <laughs> yes. Um, so, uh, yeah, but just thank you for sharing sharing a little bit of yourself with me and with our listeners today. Um, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you all for tuning in and thank you again to Ella for sharing so much of herself with us today. If you enjoyed today's episode, I think you'll also enjoy an episode we did a few weeks back, Doctor Who with David K. Barnes. David had a similar journey where he was able to connect with Doctor Who growing up, learn a lot about himself through the show, and then later grow up to actually get to write a story in the Doctor Who canon. If you'd like to listen to that episode, just scroll back wherever you're listening to this show now and find the episode labeled Doctor Who with David K. Barnes. We'll be back next week with Marissa Zeitz, who will be talking about how Clue led her into the career she has today. If you want to keep up with us between now and then, you can join us on our website and sign up for our newsletter at tannenproductions.com, or you can find me and let me know what you thought about the episode on all social platforms at Marissa Kawari. I hope you had a good time with us today, and I will see you next Wednesday.